Hello, my name is Sidney Pertnoy and I'm chair of the board of the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach. It gives me great pleasure to be able to say a few words on behalf of the organization who sponsored Names Not Numbers in your school. We are currently living through extraordinary times and have had to adjust to our new reality. Under these conditions, working from your homes, you were able to complete this project and for that we are grateful to all of the students for your dedication. Thank you to the teachers and schools for ensuring that your students could benefit from the Names Not Numbers program. This year, schools from Miami, Broward County, Palm Beach County, and Orlando all participated, creating documentaries that will be a part of the historical record. You should all be very proud. Most importantly, I want to thank our Holocaust survivors who participated. They are true heroes, and we are forever indebted to these brave individuals who volunteer their time and give of their heart. To all the students who participated in this project, I sincerely hope that you take with you memories that will last a lifetime. Thank you to Sharon Horowitz, Executive Director of the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach, and Daniel Reed, Education Coordinator, for sponsoring the Names Not Numbers program for the second year. Recognize the importance of this program, the Florida Department of Education generously funded our efforts. Our deepest appreciation to Tova Rosenberg, the director and founder of Names Not Numbers, for creating this program and to the filmmakers and editors who helped create these films. As time marches on and our precious survivors continue to age, it is up to the next generation to stand up against all forms of racism and bigotry. The films you helped create are a testament to the importance of teaching about the Holocaust and triumphing over hatred. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Laura Cohen, Assistant Principal at Everglades High School. I am truly awed by the journey our students have taken through this project. Under the direction of Mr. Bruce Klasner and with the selfless service of our guests, Judy Roden, Anita Carl, Julius Eisenstein, and John Koenig, our students have put names and faces to the lessons they had already learned about the Holocaust. Through their work with these survivors, our students have come to understand that not only was the number of people involved great, but the individual people were unique and special. Each of our students has formed a personal relationship with a Holocaust survivor. And now each of our students carries the responsibility to share their survivors' struggles and triumphs and to tell their stories to others so that we can be sure we will never experience the atrocities of the Holocaust again. In Hebrew, we say Zahor, which translates to remember. Zahor reminds us that we should never forget the destruction that hatred and bigotry can ensue. I cannot thank Mr. Klasner, our survivors, and the producers of Names Not Numbers enough for creating a culture that fosters mutual understanding and that opens doors to a future where we seek to understand others and we value and celebrate our differences. I am so proud to have been included in this project and so grateful to have had the opportunity to share this journey with our students. Thank you. To tell you that I am extremely proud of what my students have accomplished in this project, names not numbers, is a minor indication of what they have been able to do. They have now moved Holocaust education to the next level, the future. They now bear witness. They've heard the stories themselves. They've listened to the survivors. They've crafted the questions. They asked them whatever they wanted to ask. And now they will be able to prove to those individuals who are deniers that this really did happen. And they bear witness. So this project has definitely taken on a life of its own. I cannot tell you the pride that I have and the understanding that we are now moving to the next level of Holocaust education. Thank you all. I appreciate your work. Tell me a fact and I'll learn. Tell me a truth and I'll believe. But tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. The Names Not Numbers Oral History Film Documentary Project is remembering the stories of the Holocaust and is telling the story of the Holocaust for the world to hear. 
for the world to learn and to inspire future generations to combat anti-Semitism and all forms of hatred and intolerance. This unique project is in its 16th year. Over 2,500 survivors and 6,000 students have participated in it worldwide. The students were instructed by teachers and professionals. They learned interviewing techniques from journalists. They learned filming techniques and editing skills from documentary filmmakers. The students interviewed, filmed, and edited the two-hour interviews with each survivor to make 20-minute oral histories that are compiled in the Names Not Numbers documentary at the school. You're about to view the documentary Names Not Numbers, a movie in the making. This film chronicles the students as they are being trained by the professionals and includes their reflections. In it is embedded approximately 10 minutes from each interview. This is the students' work. They're filmed and edited interviews. Through this project, our students are preserving history and they are the witnesses to the witnesses. It was about 20 years ago when I got a phone call and they wanted me to speak as the survivor at one of the tables. I said, there is no way, I cannot talk about it. I never spoke to my children. I never spoke to my wife. I would start crying. And the lady said to me, okay, I understand. You can't talk then who will? I did not speak for 55 years about my life. Now I realize I have to speak and speak it out. It should never happen again to anybody. Good morning, students and guests. I'm so honored to be a part of the Names Not Numbers program that Mr. Klasner has brought to Everglades High School. This project transforms the traditional study of the Holocaust and creates an opportunity for each student to carry out the legacy of the survivors you'll meet and also to ensure the legacy of those who did not survive is remembered and respected. So in traditional Holocaust classes, you learn about the death of six million people. But that's a statistic. And when you think about six million, it's really just too much to understand. If I told you it was five million or if I told you it was seven million, would that change your concept? It really wouldn't. Because when we talk about statistics that are that big, it's just too hard to really understand the magnitude. My name is Danny Reed. I'm the Education Director at the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach. And on behalf of that organization and also Names Not Numbers, I want to welcome you to this project. So your generation is going to be part of the last generation that's actually going to be able to meet and interview and get to know a Holocaust survivor. I wanted to do this program because I'd never gotten to properly like sit down and talk to a survivor. You know, um, I have survivor family. That, is, that escaped the camps, but I was never able to talk to them. You know, they passed before I was born. And it's just, you know, having this opportunity that future generations, you know, after me won't be able to have. And it's just, it's very important to me to keep this history alive and maintained. I already had, like, general knowledge about the Holocaust, but once I joined this class, it was like, it wasn't like your normal textbook class. It was like full of raw emotion and like I've never experienced a class like that before. And whenever like people think about the Holocaust, they just think of like Anne Frank's diary or just like statistics. But you you go into this class and it's like, wow, 
this happened and not too long ago. Like, there's people there who will actually talk to you about what happened. Like, it's in this world. Like, it seems so surreal. And I think that's what, like, really got to me. So that's why I wanted to join. So with this project, we stopped talking about the statistics, especially statistics that are just too big to imagine. And we start talking about the faces of the people and the experiences of the people. You'll learn about personal struggles, personal loss, and personal triumphs. And your legacy then becomes carrying forward the memories because you're going to have a personal connection with the people that actually endured those atrocities. So why the name Names Not Numbers? Why, did, why was that name chosen as the name for this project? I think Names Not Numbers means a part of history that needs to be looked at over and over again. That was a misclassification that can never happen again. And this project is bringing that out and showing that people cannot be classified as numbers but by their name. I can tell you that of all the Holocaust survivors that I meet, one of the things that bothers them the most, that disturbs them, is that once they are gone, nobody will be left to tell their story. We are the last generation to have a first-hand talk with them, so it's important that something like the Holocaust never happens again, so we continue their story, continue speaking about it, learning about it, teaching about it. So you are actually embarking on a process where you will film and learn and know the experiences of a survivor, and you will help create a document that will be able to educate and teach others. So through this program, you're now charged with inspiring future generations. And you're going to inspire them to combat anti-Semitism and to combat all forms of hatred. The survivors you meet are going to find purpose and meaning in telling their stories to you. And now you can find purpose in making a commitment to seeing that the atrocities of the Holocaust never happen again. So good luck to you as you embrace your new role as historian and the promise of never again. Thank you. So we're here to talk about interview tactics, right, Bruce? Absolutely. All right, so an interview, has anyone here conducted an interview before? We started off with having like a journalist interview people to see how they felt about the whole like Holocaust situation, what questions they would ask survivors if they were to meet them. Well, I did learn how to like what are the proper, I guess you could say, questions to ask, how to ask them without like hurting their feelings or saying it in like a rude way, how to like communicate with people without like stuttering or like trying your best to show that you actually care about what's going on and to let them get their point across and not like interrupt them with everything. The way I look at interviews is really no different than I look at a conversation. So imagine when you went back and talked to one of your survivors without the cameras there. What you're going to be doing when you're interviewing them is so similar. You're still going to identify with them on a personal level. You just want to make sure that you have their story straight, get the facts right, and you know, really have a documentation of what happened. Don't ask did questions. Don't ask because you get a yes or no answer. You want to get the most specific response as possible. Instead of asking, oh, did you do this? Did you do that? I thought more of saying, how was your experience in this? Being more specific. Uh, you want to get the base facts and establish a storyline first. So you know, this is what happened here, then I went to here, then I went to here. And once you have those facts, you have a storyline. A lot of people who interview for the first time, they are always thinking about the next question that they're going to ask because they don't want to seem unprepared. The best thing you can do, though, is, is just listen. Listen to their answers because no matter what questions you have prepared beforehand, they're not always going to cover all the bases. They might say something in their interview that's vitally important to their story that you might otherwise miss if you're just thinking about that next question that you want to ask. So really being able to try to listen to their story as attentively and in depth as possible is massively important. So I guess the thing I'm just looking forward to is just to, to write my own questions and ask them. Something that I took away is, in terms of that, is just how to be a better interviewer in general. All right, go. Well, today we learned about the camera and how to work it. So we use like the zoom in and zoom out 
and we learned how to censor people. So like we're supposed to turn them a little bit towards the, the left or the right, depending on where they're sitting. There's a, um, it's more of just a guideline about how to frame uh, subjects in a picture. Uh, it's called the rule of thirds. You divide the image in thirds uh, vertically and uh, horizontally. Whatever subject's in the shot, that's where you want them to generally be around. Okay, so more or less, you see how this applies. He's not, he's not centered. Typically, it's like this. So the interviewer's to the left of the camera. They're looking towards them. So in the direction where they're looking, that's where you want the most space. Okay, I did not know about the rule of thirds before this, but prior, I did have like experience with the camera. When I was smaller, I would take photos all the time. It was like, it was, yeah, it was like a Sony camera, and it was like, it was like a smaller, like boxy ones. But I would take pictures a lot, and I really liked it. I find it all interesting how like it all comes together, and it's like these parts are really important, but people don't really think about it that much. It's like the background people, like they're putting the stuff together, make sure everything looks great, presentable. Feeling like nervous, but also like kind of excited in a way, because like I'm well excited to you know to learn about uh, his story. Kind of nervous because I feel like I'm gonna mess up in asking, I guess. Like we're looking forward to talking to the survivors. I interview in the Holocaust survivors a lot more intimate, and you could feel the emotion in the room a lot more. You have to have that human interaction one to one in order to fully experienced it, I believe. I'm always looking forward to meeting the survivors and being able to like speak to them, you know, not have to rely on uh, videos of them, like actually be able to interact with them myself. They express just how painful it is, and you can genuinely feel it when they talk about the horrible events that happened to them. My name is John Koenig. I was born in Budapest, in Hungary, in 1929. I was the only child. My father had his own business, and he was importing fabrics from different countries in the West. Italy, Switzerland, France, Germany. Well, we celebrated all the Jewish holidays, of course and the state holidays, the Hungarian state holidays. I would go every Friday to the synagogue. We did not exactly keep kosher, but we did not allow shellfish or pork or anything like that into the house. When I was bar mitzvah, there was a party. I was allowed to invite my friends after the services, and we went to an ice cream place. That was it. We, everybody got, all my friends, we got ice cream. My name is Anita Karl, and I was born in Lwów, Poland, in 1938. Uh, I was the middle child, uh, two sisters, one oldest and one youngest. We lived in a very nice house. My mother graduated from the University of Music and she was a concert pianist. When the children were born, she stayed at home. Uh, my grandparents had a, a large uh, factory. They manufactured baby carriages and they exported them throughout Europe. And they were business people and um, orthodox and raised their family together. We were close to 200 uh, in my family because of so many uncles and aunts and cousins. The holidays were always celebrated at my grandparents' house. Uh, sometimes, uh, well, all the Shabbat, the Friday night dinners were at my house and uh, my mother cooked. She was an excellent cook. 
She would make uh, beautiful uh, knedala for the soups and other delicacies always. I still remember the warmth and the care that my parents gave us and how much they worried about our well-being. My name is Julius Eisenstein. I was born on October, October the 13th, 1919, in a town called Tomaszów Mazowiecki in Poland. We had about 50,000 people in the town. There were about 12,000 Jews. I am one of five children. I had a father, I had a mother, I had three sisters, and I had a brother. My parents had a bakery and a grocery store. My parents wanted me to go to a, a, a college after I finished public school and four years of trade school, they could not afford it. I became a baker. I, I worked in my father's business. Judy Rodin. I was born in 1938 in a town called Berejovo, that's in Czech. My grandmother was a very important part in my life. She was a very strong woman. She managed a wooden barrel factory. During those years, pre-war and war, wooden barrels were very, very important to storage ammunition. So this type of a factory was channeled to help even the Nazi regime. They needed all that. I had a little brother a year and a half younger than I. He was very raucous. Everybody loved little Louis, and of course, so did I. My father was sent to study in La Sorbonne in France, agriculture. My mother was a romantic, a piano player, my father was drafted into the Czechoslovakian army in 1942. I was unaware of where my father was. He was just gone. They wouldn't tell me he was in the war. They wouldn't tell me any gruesome details. Therefore, my recollection of my father is very dim because I was just four years old. But through the pictures and through what I have heard, he played the violin. So between my mother and my father, they had a party going all the time. People would come. My mother was a great cook. She baked fabulously. That was her fame. And they always had a beautiful time together with us, with my brother and myself. By the way, our home was very close to the train station. So we were well connected. I loved the train. I loved the sound of train. So whenever there was a train ride, I would be the first one out the door. In 1939, when I was supposed to enter gymnasium, the Nuremberg laws came into effect. Part of the Nuremberg Laws was something called numerus clausus, which is like the rule of the numbers. The Jewish population of Hungary was 6%. Therefore, only 6% of the students in gymnasium could be Jewish, only up to 6%. Before the war broke out, the anti-Semitism, hating Jews, was the first thing from the mostly Polish people. I, I know maybe one of the reasons that I can explain is that Jewish kids 
started to go to some kind of a preschool, uh, a Jewish preschool, not the public, but a Jewish preschool. So when they came in to the public schools, they came in with kids who never went to school before. So they had a little more knowledge of what's going on in this world. And I think that was the jealousy. You smarter than I am. In school, around 10 o'clock, you had a break. But we went on the break when the non-Jewish children went back to their classes. We were not allowed to mingle. My father was no longer allowed to own his own business. We were very fortunate that my father, over the years, developed a very good relationship with his barber. And he went to the same barber for years and years and years, and of course, they developed a good relationship. So he turned his business over to the barber. He never came to the business. He was just the owner on paper. Up to the age of six, I never felt that I was a Jew and that I was different from all the others. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Here is shown the initiation of that phase of modern warfare. This is Hitler at the peak of his armed might. The civilized world knows it as the unleashing of unheard of military might and reveal for the first time the machines and weapons that are to terrorize a freedom-loving people. World War II is a reality. When the war broke out in 1939, a German who lived in Poland and went together to school with my father came in with a sheet of paper and he told to my father, get out of the business. That was the first thing that I lived through. It was extremely chaos. When the Polish army retreated towards Warsaw, if anybody knows the map of Poland, they were passing by our street where I lived. And as they passed by the Polish army retreating, there were some civilian men mixed in with the, with the soldiers with the, from the army. And we could not understand what were civilian people doing in between the army. So my father went out and asked one of those guys, why are, those, why are you here? Why are you running? What happened was when the Germans passed the border into Poland, they, the first thing was they made an announcement. All Jewish men should come out of their, of their homes and line up in a big place. So they came out and they lined up in that place and they mowed them all down. So those other people who found out that that was happening, they started to run. So they mixed up with the Polish army retreating and they were going towards Warsaw. The Nazis invaded Poland in 1939 and they came to where we lived in 1941. My father would go every Sunday morning a few blocks away was a big newsstand on one of the main roads. One day he came home and he was, his color was white. His lips were trembling. My mother looked at him and said, sit down, sit down. What happened? The Germans occupied us. How did the life change? A few days later, we had to start wearing on the street in public uh, Yellow Star. We had to hand in our radios. We were no longer allowed to use any public transportation. We could not communicate with relatives or friends. If you wanted to see them or if you wanted to talk to them, you had to go there. When the Germans came 
to us. It was the day that my youngest sister was born. They took everything of value, all the uh, paintings and the silver and the crystal, and gave my parents 24 hours to move into the ghetto. They made an announcement, everybody out of the houses, all Jewish families who live outside of the, of the periphery have to move, leave their apartment, line up in, a, in a five in a row on the street. They allowed uh, us to carry one suitcase only, each person. But my mother had to carry my youngest sister, the baby, in her arms. My oldest sister was two years older than I am, so she was five. She clung to my mother on one side and I on the other. And so, without knowing what would happen to us, we walked out of our house to never return to it. We were surrounded by men in uniform who were shouting at us, who were carrying arms and who had dogs with them, big dogs, the German shepherds. They terrorized us and they were very, very inhum inhumane to the people. They herded the people like we would be animals. They, did not call anybody by their names. They pushed us around, they badgered us, and they bullied us without mercy. And our Polish neighbors were just standing by, and no one was doing anything to stop it. They marched us into the centrum of the city where the most Jews lived, and they formed this and they said, in their, in their eyes, this was the ghetto. When the Germans came in and occupied Hungary, we knew and heard about the deportations to Auschwitz and other concentration camps. Raoul Wallenberg, who was the consul for uh, Sweden, he would go to the railway station when they took all these people. And he would stand, the following people are Swedish citizens, a Swedish subject. And he would start calling Weiss, Grün, Schwartz, all Jewish names. He didn't know any of them, but he figured there were a number of them named like that. And then they would step up and he would put them into safe houses. At the age of six, in 1944, my mother, my little brother, and I went to visit my grandmother. But that day, there was no piano playing. My mother was very somber. My little brother, who was always running around all of a sudden, stopped kicking the ball and was just quiet. I couldn't understand what's going on. My grandmother, this loving woman that picked me up and picked up my brother and sometimes both of us together to hug and kiss, that day it was not there. And she said to me, I want you to meet my very good friend. And she took my hand and said to me, would you like to go on a train ride to Budapest? Now, and my grandmother says to me, Mrs. Varyash will take good care of you. She will take you to Budapest. And tomorrow, we will all join you with your toys, with your clothes, your books. You, we will meet tomorrow in Budapest. My parents got from the Swedish embassy a Swedish flag, a Swedish plaque, and the certificate that the particular house, apartment house we lived in was Swedish territory. A couple of weeks later, my father met a friend of his who came from Vienna. And this friend said, look, 
I know the Germans and I know the Germans very well. They are not going to be deterred when they're ready to deport the Jews by a flag or a plaque. Upon stepping up of the train, Mrs. Varias asked me not to speak. As we sat on the train, she asked me to put my, her, my head on her legs, and she covered me. She said, try to sleep. And I heard her say, no, she's sleeping. She's sleeping because she's not well. She's sick. It was already into the war. I heard bombings all the time. And when we arrived in Budapest and got off the train, she rushed me, practically covered, into her apartment. Her apartment was very small. And immediately, she rushed me down to that basement or dungeon, I don't know what to call it. But it was dark and cold, and I wasn't supposed to speak to anyone. She would bring down some food for me, and it was tasteless. I couldn't tell the color because it was dark. It was like a mushy thing. And she said, eat it because this is the food they give to the horses. And that's why they have such beautiful skin and beautiful long hair. She proceeded to teach me my new name. It was Haidu Katalin. This was supposedly a Christian name. I had to hide my Jewish identity. The next day, nobody came as my grandmother had promised, and I learned later on why. My father went to the Jewish Central Committee and told them I can put anything an army would need, like uh, typewriter repair, watch repair, etc. The only thing we would like to ask is, we and our families want to be protected from deportation. A week later or whatever, my father walked into the office there and he was told, please sit down. The Wehrmacht turned you down. He said, what could be worse than that? The Waffen SS accepted your offer, and you will be working for the SS. And we were able to bring in our immediate families, and a total of 360 people will be allowed to come into the apartment house that we will assign to you, which was diagonally across the street from the SS headquarters. And each family was allow, assigned a room. In the next room was my father's younger brother. In the next room was my father's older brother with their immediate families. We felt fairly safe while we were in the house, as long as we were working for the SS. So people started to smuggle immediate relatives into the building. Before we realized, we had 900 people in the building. It was a major problem. We had no food. There was not enough food. I don't ever remember going to bed that I wasn't hungry. And I, sometimes I was so hungry I couldn't even sleep. <sighs> The Nazi law came out. Anybody that was against the Nazi rule was punished by being shot on the street. So Mrs. Varya decided to tell me that we're going to a school. But it wasn't a school. It was a convent. I couldn't ask questions because they would not answer. And on one occasion, I overheard the nuns speaking that they all died. So I realized 
that it was probably my family. My grandmother's house, the one where I departed from, became the ghetto the next day. This is why they could never leave. And then from there, they went to a larger place called a ghetto again, and from there they were transported to Auschwitz. The ghetto was surrounded by barbed wire. There was one entrance in, and that was it. They put us into a room in a building where there were already two other families. There was a uh, mattress on the floor in a corner, and this is what belonged to us. There was no food in the ghetto, so they gave us rations, and the rations consisted in one small piece of stale bread, black stale bread, and a cup not bigger than this of water. That had to last us 24 hours. So we ate this bread crumb by crumb. And I remember clearly after a few days, the hunger pains. Parents, in order to get something to eat, and if they had a daughter which was 10 years old or nine years old, they sent her out to a friend of theirs which was Polish and get some food in. I don't know if you can comprehend what that means. And when the kid came back, the Germ there were a few Germans standing at the entrance to the ghetto, and they took away the food which the kid got from somebody, and they shot those kids. There was no humanity. There was no compassion. There was hatred, pure hatred towards us. And we became people without names. After two years of this, it was easier to die than to live. What you try to do is live. I never, I remember very well all I wanted to do during the day to survive long enough that I can get into bed. And once I was in bed, I hope I'll be able to wake up. That was your primary concern. It was 1943, and it was time to close the ghetto. What does it mean to close the ghetto? It meant to put everybody on those train, on those carts on the train, and take them to a extermination concentration camp. We heard that they are losing the war, the Germans. That, that we heard, and we were very happy about it. But in the meantime, they, they took us to the train station. Uh, as we walk alongside the street, they made an announcement, all boys 18 to 25 should step out of line. I was one of those. But I didn't want to step out because I didn't want to be separated from my family. And as I go a little further, I am grabbed by the neck by a German, and I was pulled out and a punch in my face. You heard what we said. You should have gotten out when we told you to get out. And whoever they found in the apartments, they shut. And we had to pick up their dead bodies, put them on a truck, and take them to the cemetery and bury a big hole and bury them. And they packed us in in those cattle wagons, 120 people in each of those wagons. So we were cramped like sardines in a can. And uh, some people could not take it anymore or they, they fainted or whatever. And if the guy fell down, he was picked up by somebody else. And at the end of the, of the cattle car, we lined up the dead bodies so that there will be a little more room for the living bodies to move because we could not move. But there was no place for the children. The children, they decided, 
had to be killed before the long trip to the different concentration camps. When my par parents heard that they was going to be a razzia, it's called, of the children under 10 years of age, my parents were in shock, like everybody else. But my mother was a very strong and courageous woman. And against all odds, she stood up and she said, I will find a way, but I will not stand here, watch my children be murdered. She made a plan to leave the ghetto amongst the Gentile women that came to visit their husbands. Uh, the reason that uh, we could have a chance was because I looked very Aryan and my mother also had a face and a bearing of an Aryan person. So she uh, took the, a few of the jewelry that she had hidden from her and from her sisters and she sewed them in her underwear and promised my father that uh, she would send for him somehow if we are lucky to get out alive. And so in the late afternoon, where all, when all the guests from the, the, and the Ari and the German women were leaving, my, my mother spoke fluent German. Uh, she told the three of us, not to speak, not to say a word, and she walked out of the ghetto with us. She didn't know where to go, she didn't know where to ask for help, because anybody could betray us. She left all the pictures, family pictures, and all the documents behind. And she walked out of the ghetto to the train station, and she took the first train that was leaving the station. We did not know where we're going or what we're going. They, they packed us in, like I said, 120 people, and they put in a big drum in the middle for their own ways. They, what they had to do, they used that, that big kettle and the smell was impossible. I was one year in a labor camp in Poland, and there I was a shoemaker. I was making slippers for the German soldiers in the hospitals. The material was from the, the homes which the Jews had to leave. At night, when you went to sleep, we were having three rows of, of uh, just plain wood uh, and you slept there, you had your place which was about maybe 20 inches or 24 inches and that's all the place you had. And you had a pair of shoes and you put them under your head because otherwise somebody stole it. And if they stole your shoes, the next day you went out to work without shoes. And in the winter time or in the, in the fall, with the rains and the mud on the outside, you didn't get another pair of shoes or anything like this. So when we got up in the morning, we had to line up and they gave us a quart of soup. If you found a potato inside, you were very happy. It was just water and, and salt. After 12 hours work, when you came back, you got a slice of bread and a little piece of margarine. From that camp, which was called Blizzin, we went to Auschwitz. I was six months in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, you came in and you got out of the train and they chased you into the, to the, to an embankment. Before they pushed you into the gas chambers, they told everybody to undress. And you can imagine People did not believe before what's going to happen. They still did not believe. But when you told to undress men, women, 
children, everybody naked. That's when the screams and the yelling was impossible. When we woke up the next morning, the girls were standing at their fence and we could see them and they could see us and we didn't recognize them because all their hair was shaved off. And uh, when I was in Auschwitz, I worked on the outside of the crematorium and I could see every two hours a new transport coming in and they chased them out of the wagons, women with children on their hand. The crying and the yelling were incomprehensible. I saw that every day long and I will never ever forget it in my life. I had no name, I had a number. I was called by the number. That was the, the serial B-1208. We went to the last train station and we got off there in a little city called Buchach. After that happened, she was interrogated by the Nazis several times, and then they brought out a Bible, and she had to swear on the Bible that to the third generation, there was not a drop of Jewish blood in our veins. She swore it directly, and we got the papers that were required for us to live as Catholics. And this is how my life as a Catholic girl began. We were not hiding, we did not hide. We lived in a little house who are, that my mother rented from this very anti-Semitic woman. Um, there were two rooms in this house, one for us, the four of us, and one for her, and the kitchen in the center. She threatened me, if you continue being a bad girl, or if you don't finish your food, the Jew is going to get you. So I grew up having this fear of the Jewish people. I imagined the monster that has a bag on his back and puts the naughty children in there. We went to church every Sunday. I was sitting, we were sitting in the last row, and when the people in front of us made the sign of the cross, we did it. When they went on their knees to pray, we imitated. We, I didn't know yet what I was saying, but I was moving my lips like if I was saying it. And soon from the last row, I was in the front row. I had one white dress for Sundays and one pair of shoes because the rest of the week I was barefoot. In the meantime, my mother was able with the jewelry she had hidden to smuggle my father out of the ghetto. And he came to us and uh, the room that we lived in had a closet and all day long he would hide in this closet. We were not allowed to see him because as little children, we could tell a friend or somebody, you know there is a man in our room. The German officers, the SS officers, would come to inspect who was in that convent. So we had to line up in front of the building, stand at attention, and blurt out loudly our name. That was a very hard time for me. I'm lying. I didn't like to lie. Plus the fact that the Germans would come in with those double motorcycles. If you've seen old time movies, you know what they're like. There's a driver. And there's like another section of, of the motorcycle built right on it, right next to it. And there's another soldier there with guns. The mother superior, a tall lady, tall for me anyway at that time, because I was little. She carried a little box. She pop, popped that piece of candy in my mouth and I had my sweet rush. 
so I could blurt out my name and I wasn't afraid of anything. The war was coming to an end and the Germans were losing the war and retreating towards Germany. But the Germans decided that all the civil population would accompany them on the marches towards Germany. So from Auschwitz, they send us to Oranienburg. I'm talking about 1944. You have to realize that now they were, they were chased by the Allies, and they didn't know what to do. Finally, we reached uh, Krakow. And we were liberated by the Russians. And then I wound up in Dachau. I was liberated in Dachau by the American army. The day of the, li of the liberation, we were, we were laying, there were people laying all over the floor. And the next morning, a kid came in from the outside and he said, there are no more Germans on the watchtowers. I ran outside and I took a look and sure enough, they, there were no Germans on the watchtowers. So I went towards the, the fence. The fence was normally electrified. But when the Americans came in, they shut off the electricity. I woke up one day and I saw the nuns with a different face. They were also prosecuted, by the way, okay, as religious people. I couldn't imagine what was happening. And a few days later, my aunt Susan appeared in the convent with my uncle Eugene. I thought they were lost too. One day I sat with my mother and we made a list of all the relatives that she had. We counted there were 33. They were all deported. Of the 33, three came back. I never went back to my home, neither did my aunt and uncle. We knew that was all lost completely because what the Nazis didn't take, the rest of the people took. So from Budapest, somehow they managed to take me to Paris, France, also hidden again on a lady's le uh, legs covered. My aunt and uncle had some sort of a passport, but I had no papers at all. It was called being stateless and illegal. So we managed my aunt and uncle to buy a visa. It had to be purchased to Venezuela. They accepted us. We had to declare that we were Catholics because it was a Catholic country by law. And I ran that business for a few years. In the meantime, I met my wife and she was also in the same concentration camps that I was, but I didn't know her then. From this uh, big family that we were in Lvov, the only one who survived was my uncle in Vienna. He was the eldest brother of my father. My father could not go with us. He was left behind, hidden in, uh, in this closet, hoping that the Russians would, were only a week ago away that they would liberate him. When we left, the Germans found him in this hiding place. He died at 33 years of age, an Orthodox Jew, a good person who had never committed a crime or something or a bad deed. He believed in God and he sacrificed his life for his beliefs. 
my f friend George comes in and says, I met a fellow yesterday who was in a displaced person camp in West Germany. And he's looking for th three youngsters like me. I was 16 years old to go back with him to West Germany. And George says to me, would you like to go? I see his George says, I'm going. Would you like to go? I said, I got to ask my parents. So I asked my parents. And they said, yes, go. There is no future here. Arrived December 12, 1947. I knew nobody, had no relatives. My father had a friend, high school friend, with whom he kept in touch. He came, he picked me up at the ship and found me a room in a small hotel in Manhattan. He found me a job. I spoke very little English and I started to go to night school primarily to go to, to learn English. I came to the United States in 1950. I got a sponsor. I don't even know who the sponsor was, but I got a sponsor and I uh, came to the United States. Never met that sponsor. I don't know who, he, who they were. I have two children. I have a daughter and I had a son, which is a lawyer. And he was a lawyer for Rockefeller in I am proud to say that. Right after the interview, it's a lot, I feel a lot more touched because hearing it from her and not just by research or by a documentary, hearing it firsthand adds so much more emotion and you can feel how she felt. It's just the difference between meeting them in real life and hearing it is the emotion in their voice. It really affects you, how you feel, because you know things happen, but like hearing the emotion in their voices and 70 years later still the pain in their voice, it affects you. You can um, relate to it in different ways. You don't have to be of Jewish descent or you don't, you don't have to personally have gone through something tragic. You just have to understand that psychological um, human aspect of it. I'm Muslim so I'm ha and I'm also half Indian, half Pakistani. So because of what happened with 9-11, like the discrimination and the uh, hatred and still goes around, especially with me at church or like going out anywhere. Whenever I like talk about the Holocaust or Jews, I feel in a personal level because of what happens to me on an everyday basis. Slowly I'm like learning how to be proud of myself for being like someone mid, but also a Muslim woman in the U.S. Puedo relacionar como ellos perdieron a sus familiares, como perdieron su infancia en cierta manera cómo tenía miedo de no volver a ver a sus familiares, cómo cambió su vida radicalmente. Yo me mudé aquí sola. O sea, mi papá se vino cuando yo tenía seis meses. Y obviamente sabía que mi papá estaba aquí, pero jamás lo vi. Cuando yo conocí a mi papá, no lo reconocí. Tenía siete años. Dejé mi vida en Venezuela. Me vine sola. La situación estaba muy fea. Eh, la inseguridad más que todo. Mi mamá, mis hermanos, mis abuelos. Todo está allá. Me da miedo que cuando vuelva no voy a hacer lo mismo. Mi familia no está. Todo ha cambiado. Entonces, por eso lo puedo relacionar. Por eso sé que las historias se repiten. ¿Me entiendes? Que apreciamos lo que tenemos. Que valoremos todo. Que le demos un abrazo a nuestros padres, al familiar que tengamos, a la persona que está a cargo de nosotros, no importa quién sea. Valoremos todo. Todo porque no sabemos en qué momento lo vamos a perder o no lo vamos a tener tan presente en nuestras vidas. Siento que el mayor error de nosotros como personas es que valoramos las cosas cuando no las tenemos. Siento que podemos cambiar eso. Siento que podemos sacar el mayor provecho a las cosas que tenemos ahorita, ser más agradecido, dar gracias a Dios que tenemos comida, tenemos un techo, tenemos ropa, porque hay gente que está pasando la muy mal. You do not 
not have to like me, but why do you hate me? I didn't do anything to you. The word hate should not be in the English vocabulary. There is no reason to hate anybody. You don't like me, I have no problem with you. Don't associate with me, stay away from me, I'll stay away from you. But why do you hate me? It could happen again if not enough people stand up to make a change. Not just being a uh, bystander and actually doing something about it. Getting out there and like, actually like being an activist or things like this, like to show that this happened before and it can happen again. Accepting the fact that we're all different, that we enjoy different things, that we believe in different things, and that somebody else's life path doesn't affect me directly and, and I don't need to hold hate in my heart for somebody else. A, you see something evil, you have to stand up. You do not accept it because it could happen to you. With courage, inner strength, everything is possible. You have all the power in the world to handle hatred, panic, and everything else that comes with it. Do not allow injustice to rule you. Do not be afraid because all of you have the strength and the courage within you. And you can stop bullying, you can stop injustice.